All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Debbie, I'm on staff here in the Worship Arts Department. I'm filling in for Scotty, who is off traveling for his 40th wedding anniversary. Pretty cool. Um, so would you guys stand with me? Um, I know it's been quite a week for probably a lot of you. Maybe you're dealing with water in your basement or uh, no power for a few days. Um, but it's times like that that I think that we really see, you know, the family of God come together. Maybe you have loaned out a generator to somebody or, you know, let them use your Wi-Fi, right? Or given them your chainsaw or something. So I'm really glad that we can all be a part of this amazing family, which we sing together, the family of God. So with one voice, we'll sing to the Lord. All right? If it, if it takes a little bit to learn the melody, it's okay. But by that third time, I want everybody singing out with one voice. We sing to the Lord. All right?
I know we don't do them too often, but we got the the greatest male youth pastor on our current staff here at Trinity, <laughs> Griffin. Thank you. What an what an introduction. Uh, so my name is Griffin Swihart. I have the pleasure of serving as one of the student ministry directors here at Trinity. So if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, that's who I am. Um, I'm reminded as I stand up here to do live announcements, which is a rarity, I'm reminded actually of my home church. Uh, when we would do announcements, we always did them live, and there was always a slide on the screen that would say, First Christian Church, Top 5, and there were never less than seven or eight bullet points on there. And so I feel a little bit like that, where I'm like, I have a few quick announcements, and then I look at my list. We're going to be up here for at least 10 or 15 minutes, so bear with me. No, but uh, if you got a bulletin on your way in, the first thing I want to point your attention to is the Connect card. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining us. We're really glad that you could join us this morning. If you get a moment to fill that out, uh, you can drop that in the offering box, or you can take it directly. We've got a Connect desk uh, right back by the entry door that you probably came through. Uh, there's somebody there who would love to meet you, connect with you, talk with you a little bit about Trinity and what we believe and a role that you could fill here as well. And we've got a gift for you, so we would love for you to stop by. We just want to get to know you a little bit and, and get to, to share in community with you. Um, so if you've got your Connect card and you're new here, we would love for you to take a moment and fill that out. As Debbie alluded to at the beginning of service, uh, we're so glad that you guys, uh, in the midst of the storms these past two days, have been a little rough for a lot of us. Um, we thank you that you got here. Uh, we hope that you're doing well, and we're praying for you too, especially if you're dealing with flooded basements or anything like that. Uh, Trinity, we lost power for a little bit, and so as part of that, um, all of the bathrooms, except for the ones all the way down in the Family Life Center, are out of order. So we just appreciate your patience with us in that. Um, so just a reminder, if you have to use the bathroom, we ask that you take the three mile walk down to the other side of the church and use the bathrooms there. Uh, I want to, on behalf of staff as well, I want to thank you for your generosity. Um, if you remember, we just did this backpack drive for Central Detroit Christian and for families and students in need there. And through your generosity, uh, we were able to donate 140 backpacks. So thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing blessing it is to that community and to those families and those students. Uh, a couple other announcements for you as well. Where are my middle schoolers at? Any middle schoolers in here? Look at that. School hasn't even started for all of you, and there's no energy already. <laughs> uh, so if you're a middle schooler, starting on September 10th, I want to remind you that during the second service, you can join us in the youth room. We are doing this Alpha Youth Series where we're asking all kinds of great questions. Um, we do Alpha with adults, and we do Alpha with our students as well. So we'll be asking questions like, life, is this it? Exploring uh, the identity of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God, talking about new life, how we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, evangelism, the church, asking all of these great questions. And so if you are in 6th, 7th, or 8th grade, starting September 10th and running for, I think, 10 or 12 weeks, uh, we'll be meeting in the youth room. We invite you to join us. You're also, of course, welcome to attend service with your family if you'd prefer that or if you're serving in Trinity Kids. Uh, but it's an invitation we want to extend to you, our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. It was a wonderful time last year, and we're excited to continue that again. Uh, this is for an invitation for all of us. Two weeks from now, September 10th, we are going to be having a ministry fair. And so we did this last year, and we're excited to do it again. So if you're new here, if you've been here for a decade, it's an awesome opportunity to come and to see all of the different 
uh, worship uh, opportunities there are, all of the different service opportunities there are here at Trinity. So we're going to have a ministry fair, different booths set up for Trinity kids and Awana and student ministry and prime time, all of the wonderful ministries that are going on where you can go and you can learn more about a ministry that you may not know about. If you're looking for a way to connect and looking for a way to serve in the church, you can go and stop by some of the booths and get more information that way as well. And then, of course, who doesn't love ice cream? Uh, we're going to have an ice cream Sunday bar as well, so you can stay after service. Uh, we're actually, between both services, so between the 9 o'clock and the 1030, you can join us down in the FLC Worship Center for an ice cream Sunday bar, get to know people at the booths. And then similarly, if you plan on joining us for our 1030 service, you can stay afterward. Same thing, get to know some of the ministries, uh, get some more information, enjoy some ice cream. It's going to be a great time, and that's not next week, but the week after, so that's September 10th. If you've been at Trinity for any length of time, you're probably aware of midweek. Uh, it's Wednesday nights as a church. We do so many different things here. The church is just completely packed. Like all of our classrooms are filled with adults in life groups, with students in student ministry. Our middle schoolers meet on Wednesday nights in Awana as well. And we have had some fantastic leaders as part of that who have served this midweek dinner. It's been a, a fantastic, rich tradition that we've had of gathering at 6 o'clock from 6 to 6.30 and enjoying a meal together. And we've had some fantastic leaders that have been leading that ministry for well over a decade and they are taking a step back just to pause and to take a break. And so we're looking for new leadership to fill their shoes. So if you're interested in all, at all in serving on our midweek dinner team, you can sign up online. Uh, you can sign up at the, Connect, at the Connect booth as well. There's an opportunity if you or your group or some friends are interested in hosting uh, and cooking and preparing and cleaning up the meals even just once a month if you're interested in serving as an individual or as a team. Uh, there's space for you to do that. And so we would love to encourage you to sign up. Uh, there's a table in the gathering space for you to do that. Similarly, uh, in midweek, Awana is starting up soon as well. That is for our, um, our, our lower elementary kids through upper elementary and preschool as well. Um, so our young kids, Awana on Wednesday nights, starts September 13th and registration is open. So if you've got a child or a grandchild or a neighbor that would be interested in this, registration is open. You can get them involved in that. Uh, you've got the email up on the screen. Ali Marachka is our wonderful Awana coordinator. So you can get in touch with her. They're looking for registration, of course, for kids but also always looking for volunteers as well. So if you're interested in serving on Wednesday nights and you've got some space and some time to do that, uh, we would love for you to email Allie, get a hold of her. She's always looking for great leaders as well. It's an amazing opportunity to pour into these kids and frankly to be poured into as well. I've had a chance to serve in there a couple of times and the kids, it all, honestly almost feels like you get more than you actually give in a service role like this. So I would love to encourage you, if you've got the time in your calendar, if you've got the, the desire to serve, it's an awesome opportunity to do so. Uh, just a couple announcements more, so thank you for bearing with me, um, and then we'll get on with the rest of our worship service. If you want to worship with us through giving this morning, uh, you can do so online, you can do so by mail, or as you make your way out of service um, on the doors on the right, uh, there's a box by the door that you can give uh, physically as well. And so if you want to join us in worship through giving, uh, it's a great way to give back to God the ways that we have been so richly blessed by Him. And then one final announcement, and followed by a video. Uh, speaking of Wednesday nights, we are super excited to offer this new uh, marriage class. And so it's open to both married people and to singles, um, but we're for the first time offering a marriage class on Wednesday nights. There is a sign-up. I believe it's $50 for a single person, $100 for a couple. Um, but it's an amazing opportunity to grow in your relationship, to find ways to prioritize your marriage and grow closer to your partner and also grow closer to God. And it's open to singles as well. If you're just looking for ways to grow in communication skills or if you're hoping one day, desiring relationship, desiring to be married, uh, this is a great opportunity to continue to learn those skills and to, to learn what it looks like to prioritize God in your relationship and to prioritize the other person in your relationship and grow in that way, even when you don't have a spouse already. And so we want to encourage you to sign up for that. And we've got a testimony from a couple that has gone through the class before. And so I'm going to get off the screen or off the stage so you don't have to look at my face anymore. And I want to invite you to turn your attention to the screens and hear from uh, a couple that's gone through this class before as you consider signing up for it yourselves. Hello, my name is Bill Thatcher. This is my wife, Judy. Pastor Tom and Ruth Ann asked us to share about our experience with the Heart and Soul class that we took now several years ago. And we can safely say that all of the other marriage material that we had studied did not have the impact that the Heart and Soul class did. We had read lots of books, we had attended marriage retreats, 
but the heart and soul class really went deeper and really helped us to understand a lot of the behaviors that we are exhibiting as adults. <laughs> Ish, adultish. Ish, adults. And so, <laughs> so I would say at that point of time, I um, it was a very tough time in our marriage, and it really hit a wall, and I needed more answers than the typical marriage classes at that point of time um, were being given. I appreciate um, uh, Ruth Ann and Tom coming together and really bringing a class that was spirit, soul, and body. Not just spirit, and if you're a more spiritual person, you could do this, but really bringing in the soul, the baggage, the stuff that we come into marriage with, and helping us to recognize the triggers that we have within ourselves that create probably illogical and maybe logical conflict within our marriage and helping us recognize those, the walls we put between us. And when we put walls between us, because we're covenant partners, we put walls between us and God. And um, helping us to recognize what those words were and tear them down. And after that class, we um, had a, a tremendous breakthrough. And it was a, it was such a blessing to us. And, um, and yeah, can't say enough and we really appreciate uh, the anointing that Pastor Tom and Ruth Ann have to help people, couples like us, cu new couple, newlywed couples and oldlywed <laughs> couples, um, to have breakthrough and have a better marriage. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so we can't recommend enough. We pray that you'll attend and we pray that it have a life-changing impact upon your marriage as well. God bless. Good morning. I'm Doreen Sharp. Um, my husband Paul and I have been attending Trinity about 18 years. Currently, I serve as a deacon and I help with coffee, uh, work at the children's desk, and um, I like helping out in the kitchen for various events, so you'll often see me in the kitchen. I'm going to read. Uh, some scripture for you this morning from Psalm 78, 5 through 8. The Lord the God decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commended our ancestors to teach their children, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children, then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commands your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. This is the word of the Lord. grab a seat. Uh, my name is Mark, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you guys. We, we uh, at the church lost power. How many of you lost power or lost a tree or lost tree limbs? Look at um, lots of us in this room. It was a big deal. Uh, so today we're going to uh, just be together. We're worshiping, which is really, really cool. And I want to ask the question, how do we see different generations in our culture interacting with one another? A and secondly, how should different generations in our church interact with one another. Uh, we're, 
in the middle of a great series uh, we're calling High Five. It's talking about what are the markers of success for our church? How do we know when we're following God's mission for what he has for us right now? What are some different uh, pictures, if you will, of, of what life looks like as we live together? And we've, we've talked about a couple of these. One, celebrate salvation, about how we love to see people come to know Jesus, to come alive in Christ, uh, to be baptized in Him, to be uh, giving testimony to His salvation in their life. We want to be a church that continues to live life with Bibles wide open and have a discipleship culture where we're growing in Christ, we're following Jesus together. Next week, we'll talk about missions and being mission-minded. We'll talk a bit about uh, 210, two great worship services that we continue to make better and better with one church and zero debt. Today, we're going to talk about cross-generational community. And in our culture, over the last few years, uh, it feels like a small-scale war has broken out between different cultures. And uh, sometimes it's done in funny ways. Maybe you'll recognize how it's done in this commercial uh, that we're going to show right now. This is a funny way to poke fun at some of the different ways uh, that people interact with one another. Let's watch this. Hi, Dr. Rick. It's Julie. Just leaving you a voicemail. My number is 618-437-7425. Okay. It's for Can Dr. anyone Dad. tell me what Julie did wrong there? You got to repeat the number. I mean, no one's ever going to get it the first time. Nope. Didn't leave her last name. No, the, the phone tells you who called. She didn't mention a good time to call her back. How am I supposed to know when to call her back? Uh, no, she just sh shouldn't have left a voicemail. Nine out of ten times a text will do. Progressive okay. can't save you from becoming your parents, but we can save you money when you bundle home and auto with us. Well, welcome to the Progressive Insurance Auditorium at Trinity Church. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Rick is constantly, and you've seen these commercials, right? He's constantly trying to help younger people not become like their parents, the most annoying habits that they have or the goofy things that we do as, as older adults. So he's constantly and unsuccessfully trying to help with that. Some of the skirmishes um, revolve around this battle that's taken place between boomers and millennials. Anybody hear about this? You're participating in this. Um, so <laughs> lots of you... Uh, so it's, it starts out with different jabs, right, back and forth. It's jokes that, that oftentimes were started by the boomers about the worst caricature of millennials. And so you, you get jokes like, you know, why can't millennials take a joke? Well, because the jokes always hit a little bit too close to their parents' home. Uh, groaners, right? Or, and then the millennial rejoinder, of course, is, you know, my grandpa told me, you millennials are too dependent on your technology. So I unplugged his life support. <laughs> Whew! <laughs> or, or behind every broke millennial, there's a baby boomer that makes six figures but can't open a PDF. Mmm. As it goes back and forth, it, uh, sometimes it takes the form of memes or pictures. If you don't know what a meme is, then maybe you're part of the older generation. That's the point. So, so much criticism from boomers uh, saying, saying stuff that the phrase, okay, boomer, becomes a thing, which is a way of saying, you older people just don't have a clue. And so you see pictures like um, this one up on the screen. I think we have some pictures. So, so you might recognize this guy, Willy Wonka, in the chocolate factory. Oh, I should be able to afford a house at 20 because you bought one for $11,000 in 1966. Okay, boomer. We have kids. You cannot do that, right? Um, so other generations... They just sit back and laugh, and they think, oh, if those younger people or those older people get it, so I'm a Gen Xer right on the border, and you might recognize this photo, uh, this movie, and this is another meme. Just remember, for every boomer that hates millennials, there's a generation in between that hates you both, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it, it just goes on and on like that, so people my age and above complain that the younger generations don't work as hard, they're not as patriotic, they are too entitled, they're res as resilient as snowflakes, and they love their participation trophies. Hmm? Younger generations complain about their bigoted and backward parents and grandparents that they've left them a country that's over $32 trillion in debt, refuse to deal with climate change, and constantly say, back in our day, as if we could time travel back when typewriters were the most important technology uh, that existed. 
Here's an example, like, here's a quote I'll put up on the screen. This is an example of some of the disdain of an older generation for a younger generation. This is just kind of the way that the battle goes. This person said, the world is passing through troublous times. The young people of today think nothing of nothing but themselves. They have no reverence for parents or old age. They're impatient of all restraint. They talk as if they knew everything. And what passes for wisdom with us is foolishness with them. As for the girls, they're forward, immodest, and unladylike in speech, behavior, and dress. Who said that? Did anybody recognize that? Was it like a right-wing politician? Was it some newscaster? Ancient Greek. Listen, this was Peter the Hermit, a preacher back in the Crusade days. 1074 said those words. Or maybe you've heard of a guy named Plato. Here's what Plato said uh, around 370 B.C. What's happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders. They disobey their parents. They ignore the law. They riot in the streets, inflamed with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What is to become of them? Of course, little did Plato know that the people of that generation that he was referring to would go on to lead incredible developments in mathematics and astronomy and language and even invent something so seemingly insignificant but widely used as the alarm clock. (laughs) Or what about this? Another quote uh, from the 8th century B.C. This is 700s B.C., 2,700 years ago. A guy named Hesiod wrote this, I see no hope for the future of our people if they're dependent on frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, who's ever said that? When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly disrespectful and impatient of restraint. So maybe there have always been misconceptions, uh, aspersions cast about different generations. Maybe there's always been a little bit of uh, malcontent. But what does God have to say about it? What does God have to say to his people, to us? What does God have to say to people across all generations about how we, as all generations, ought to interact together? It's a bit different than what our culture is pointing to today. So, so here's where I want to go today. I'm going to give you two scriptural foundations uh, for our life together. What does the Bible say about generations and how we interact? And then three uh, surprising benefits of living the way that God calls us to live intergenerationally, and then six ways to get started uh, at that. And then we'll have a seventh inning stretch sometime along the way for that, all right? Um, so, so one, scripture models, uh, scripture models and encourages intergenerational friendships. I'll define, just making this up a little bit, intergenerational friendship is a friendship between older and younger that's at least 15 years different, maybe 20 but somehow uh, different generations. Where do we see that in Scripture? We see it actually modeled all over the place. You see lots of different uh, intergenerational relationships. One of those that's kind of surprising to you if you grew up in church is this relationship between David and Jonathan. Um, If you've ever heard the story back in the Old Testament of of David and, and Saul's son Jonathan and their friendship, you might remember in 1 Samuel 18, where it says that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And you see them doing stuff together. You see them fighting battles together. There's this incredibly close friendship between these two men. And because of that friendship, because of the way that we think of of these two guys, we think of them probably as about the same age. Uh, Chad Bird, who's a great Old Testament scholar, uh, points out as he looks through the chronology of all these different people in the Old Testament, they were probably 30 years different in age. Jonathan was 30 years older than David, and yet they became great friends. Uh, you see examples uh, from different places. Uh, Samuel and Eli in the Old Testament. You have Samuel, the priest, Eli, the young boy, who hears this voice, doesn't know what it is. He goes, and, and Samuel says, uh, eventually, listen to this voice, and it turns out to be the voice of God. You have this great relationship. Eli needs Samuel. Samuel needs Eli. Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. Naomi and Ruth. Paul and Timothy. All these are examples of deep intergenerational friendships. Deep intergenerational relationships. 
And so you see this enduring value, Old Testament and New Testament, for thousands of years. This is how God wants us as his people to live. And I can just say I am deeply grateful for the older men in my life. Um, The age that is older keeps getting higher and higher for some reason. But um, so many different times in my life, when my dad passed away, there were several men that I leaned into at this church. Uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that helped me process what it looks like to lose a dad. It's a big deal. Or when you're struggling with parenting teenagers, lots of different men I would turn to, or different things with relation to finances or aging, I continue to turn to older men. I also am deeply grateful for younger men and women in my life, uh, both in my family and at this church, that I talk to about different things they're experiencing and, and different ways, and I learn more about music, or I learn more about politics, I learn more about culture, and lots of different wisdom from intergenerational relationships. That's a big deal throughout Scripture. The second thing that I would say from the Bible is that the church, our church, all churches, the church worldwide, consists of all generations doing life together. And if there's a sermon and a sentence for today, if there's one thing that you take away, you forget everything else I say, this is the big deal. This is the big idea for today. The church consists of all generations living life together. Think about the times in the Bible. If you're, if you're a reader of the Bible, how many times in the Bible does it describe the church as the family of God or the body of Christ or a community of believers? It is all of us together. A couple of different times uh, in my pastoral ministry, I found myself in a, in a span of a week officiating a wedding, officiating a funeral, and doing a baby baptism. It's kind of surreal in a way, but it's one of the great privileges that I have as a pastor to be able to minister uh, with and to our church family, you guys, across all generations. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's a reminder of the diversity of, of church and the way it's supposed to look across all of our ages. So some of us are younger, uh, some of us are older. I'll leave it to you to decide which category you put yourself in. But we're all across the spectrum, and that's actually really, really good. In 1 Timothy uh, 5, Paul is talking to his young protege, Timothy, And he's giving different instruction about intergenerational relationships and how do you interact as a young man, as somebody who is tasked with setting up churches. And that's what Timothy's doing. He says stuff like this, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. If you're going to talk to your dad about something that your dad needs to have some wisdom You ought to do that with a lot of respect, and and Paul's saying that. He says, treat younger men like they're your brothers. Treat older men as mothers, which would be a respectful, kind, helpful way of of treating people, and younger women as sisters. And you can make a lot of hay about this, about not looking lustfully after younger women, but treating them as your sister in Christ with absolute purity, he says. And then he goes on in in, uh, the next verse, and he's talking about how uh, parents and and children need to take care of their parents as they get older. He's uh, talking about in the context of widows. He says, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. In that culture, you would see somebody who loses a husband, and and they don't have a job. They weren't working as much, and so these women would be in financial straits. And he says, give proper recognition to them, help them. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they need to learn to, first of all, put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. And so repaying their parents and grandparents. For this is pleasing to the Lord. So he gives different instructions. Titus 2 is another place. It's an explicit call, if you go to that passage, of, of women and men respecting their elders teaching their youngers, if I can say it that way, training a new generation. That just continues on. That's constant in Paul. You go back to Psalm, the verse that Doreen read at the beginning, Psalm 145, verse 4. We hear the command, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. There's something about an expectation 
that God has for his people that we will be interacting with one another intergenerationally and that the norm ought to be that we as older generations are helping to train, disciple the younger generations. And the younger generations would want that. But there's also lots to be gained from a younger generation for the older generation. In the Bible, we as God's people cannot be the ones who are casting aspersions, making jokes about each generation. We need to be working together in Christ. Amen? I read one guy, he said uh, about the church, he said, from the newly baptized infant to the homebound aged widow, all are members of the faith community. None are potential members on the young side. None are ex-members. Just because you're sick or infirm and haven't been in the building for five years, you're not, not a member of the church. You're not a former member. He says, though some congregations may have no younger members, and some congregations may have no older members, most have all five generations. We're all members of one body. And by five generations, uh, this next picture on the screen, sometimes the wording of description of different generations, I don't, you don't need to see when people are born and what, how, where you fit, but we kind of know, like you have five different generations, even in this room. You have people who are born uh, between 1900 and 1945, the uh, traditionalists or the different names for that generation. You have the boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, uh, Gen Z. There's younger. It keeps going. It keep make, whoever makes up the next name of the next generation wins a participation trophy. All of us together working side by side. That's the way God designed the church. It's not easy, though. So even though that is true, God designed the church that way, God designed us that way with all of us together, sometimes as you're interacting across generations, you have a hard time figuring out common things to talk about. You have different interests, different preferences, different ideas of what community even looks like. You don't listen to the same music sometimes, you don't watch the same shows. So sometimes the things that we just normally talk about as human beings are harder to fit as we interact across generations. But that's the norm. That ought to be the norm is that we are interacting across generations because we don't, in Christ, just break off into our own special interest groups and only hang out with people our own age. We're meant to be interacting across generations because in Christ, we are one family. We are one people of God. That's why when we wrote our, our, our strategic plan and we wrote these high five, I didn't use the term intergenerational. I used the term cross-generational community as a way of just reminding us that we are intergenerational because of the cross of Jesus. Because outside of the cross of Jesus, when you just look at the culture at large, there's no reason for generations to interact. And it oftentimes doesn't happen very well. But in Christ, we can and we should interact because true biblical community means pursuing people that you normally wouldn't hang out with because you know that that's a brother in Christ, that's a sister in Christ, and I need to learn from that person. Amen? I, as I was thinking about this this week, there are three surprising ways that, that's a benefit to us. I can't give you chapter or verse for any of these things, but I'm going to put these all up on the screen so you can see them. Three surprising benefits of us interacting well together uh, one, it reinforces, reinforces discipleship as a never-too-old journey. Um, here's what I mean by that. There's a, a great book from the past, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Some of you have read that. You've read it to kids. Uh, in this great uh, old book made into movies and so on, Pilgrim is this guy who, who uh, is on his journey through life. And it goes from a young man all the way through the end of his life and, and it shows the ups and the downs, the temptations and all the different things. And, and you realize that spiritual life or discipleship in Christ, following Jesus, is this lifelong journey. And that's actually really a great metaphor that uh, life in Christ is like a journey. And when you're young, you realize that because you're going through school, you're, you're growing up, you're going through uh, elementary school to middle school to high school, then maybe to college or jobs, and, and then you enter real life. <laughs> 
And then, and this is what I used to think, and maybe you've thought this before, when you get to be an adult, then you're a finished product. And, and you don't grow anymore. You're just kind of static. You're like the piece of toast that just sits on the counter and you just grow old, crusty, and moldy. <laughs> but what you realize, you know, when you hit adulthood, you realize, wow, I'm, I'm still growing, actually. There are things that I, I know t- now that I didn't know 10 years ago. I just sat down last week and I was asking my mom and her husband, um, what, it, what was, if you could talk to your 20-year-old ago self, what would you say to that self? And what, how have you grown over these 20 years? And we just had a great dialogue about that because every one of us as adults, we keep growing, we keep changing, we keep morphing, we keep becoming, hopefully, more and more like Christ. And to have a younger generation see that is actually really encouraging to know that once I get to be an adult, I'm not a finished product. <laughs> I actually continue to grow. That's a huge benefit of us working together together. That's number one. Number two, an edification spiral, we'll call it. And, and that's just a fancy way of saying when, when I see and when you see a teenager or a child give their life to Christ and be baptized on a stage or give a testimony about the way that Christ has changed their life, I get pumped about that. When I see a, a teenager or a college student who's, who's wrestling through some of the faith issues that they're dealing with, and they're honestly trying to learn what it looks like to follow Christ in their generation. I get really excited about that. And when I get excited about that, and when you get excited about that, it causes us to take stock of our spiritual life. And we begin to think, man, if, if, like, I don't need to be old and stodgy. I can continue to grow. And so it makes me excited. Then when a younger generation sees you excited and sees you giving or serving or, or teaching or, or any number of things, it gets them excited. And the more that goes, it becomes a positive spiral, and that becomes a healthy church, a good church that knows that the value of intergenerational relationships is we, we keep building one another up. Amen? You see that? And then third, a blind spot mirror. You know when you're driving behind a, a semi-trailer and they, you see the sign on there that says, be careful, I've got blind spots here, I can't see. Because no matter how, they, how hard they try, they can't see you coming in certain spots. It would be nice if we as human beings had blind spot mirrors where we could see the things that we can't see. Because sometimes, and all generations have their blind spots, we don't know what we don't know until somebody points that out to us. We don't know the assumptions that we have or the words that we use, and we don't realize maybe as an older generation that the things that you might say about uh, relation to gender or race or politics can be really highly offensive to a younger generation. And a younger generation needs to see that some of their enthusiasm, some of the, the uh, just uh, optimism about life isn't actually going to help them. <laughs> they need to be optimistic, but they need to have some realism, and they need to see that. We need blind spot mirrors in our life. And sometimes intergenerational communication is great at that. There are some real benefits to living life with different people of different ages. And so if I could give you one key uh, next step or one uh, takeaway, one daily little, if you will, and this will be challenging for each one of us, it's to identify somebody who's not your age and get to know them better. Identify somebody who's 15, 20 years different from you and get to know them in a better way. And you might say, well, how do I do that? It's actually not that hard. It's not rocket science. I'm going to give you six ways. We'll walk through these quick. Six ways that we can foster and we try to foster intergenerational community here at our church. And one of them is to volunteer uh, in the church body. (laughs) Because service in our church is not limited to one age group. You don't have to be over 55 in order to serve in different ministries. Uh, When our daughter was in 11th grade, she was part of a a women's ministry outreach team. And she would meet regularly with with all the adults, and they interacted together, and it was amazing. Uh, Every month, our kids, our teens, our adults work side by side at the food pantry. They're packing food, they're serving food to people who are in need. Last year and lots of years before that, we participated as a church in Operation Christmas Child where adults and, and kids together are packing toys for kids uh, to, to give away. 
our Awana ministry, our Vacation Bible School, great places for adults and teens to work side by side, serving with one another, learning from one another, and helping an even younger generation grow in their faith. In fact, uh, I can just say this. Alyssa Towns, our children's director, would love to have more of you helping out with Awana on Wednesday nights or with kids' ministry on Sunday mornings. Um, Let me just press in for a second on this. And if you squirm a little bit, I want you to. (laughs) Parents that come to our church with their children, with their teenagers, need an opportunity to be able to come into worship together with us on a Sunday to learn and be in a small group on Wednesdays. We need that. And, and you remember, empty nesters, those of you who have kids who are gone, you remember how awesome it was to have people who are older than you when you had kids that were helping out in Awana or VBS or Sunday morning Sunday school. You remember how awesome it was. Be that person for one of these younger couples. And if you're a, a person, a single or a couple who has children in our, our kids' ministry, um, here's, here's my challenge to you, is you've got to think of Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights as a co-op, not as a daycare. A co-op means that you come together and you share in the duties. You, you, a daycare means you just drop off the child and you pay for somebody else to do something. That's not how we run a church. A church is a co-op. A church means that you come and one week you're volunteering and you're watching the kids and you're teaching the kids and you're learning the kids' names and you're, you're investing in their life. And then the next three weeks, the next four weeks, the next five weeks, somebody else is doing that so that you can be in worship or you can come into cl- class or small group on a Wednesday night. Every one of us ought to be serving in different ways. Maybe children's ministry isn't your thing, teen ministry, but more of us need to be doing that. Now can I get an amen, which means I'm with you and I'm volunteering. (laughs) And here's the thing, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but as your pastor, I just want you to realize that the work done in our children's ministry, especially like ages 5 to 12, is probably the most strategic ministry in our entire church. We have lots of great ministries, lots and lots of great ministries, but that probably is the most strategic of all of them. Research firm uh, Barna has showed um, that the deadline, if you will, it doesn't just stop here, but the deadline for shaping the faith of our young people is probably close to the age of 13, 12 or 13. One of the things they said is a person's worldview is primarily shaped and is firmly in place by the time somebody reaches the age of 13. When they're in our kids' ministry here on Wednesdays, on Sundays, they're learning and growing and having their faith shaped. Wouldn't it be awesome to have their faith shaped by you? Somebody who loves Jesus and wants to help that child come to know him and grow in him. And it makes a huge difference. Um, your investment in a child's life, and again, I want to make you squirm a little bit. There's some grim statistics about the number of kids leaving the church once they're grown. David Kinnaman is one of the authors who wrote a book, You Lost Me, Why Young Christians Are Leaving the Church and Rethinking the Faith. And studies, his studies have shown, and others have borne this out, that only three in ten children who grow up in church end up continuing in their faith into adult years. Three in ten. And lots of us in this room have experienced that in our own family. The heartbreak of seeing a child who decides to turn away from Jesus as they get older. And it's a nuanced issue, but one of the key findings that they're seeing is that children and young adults who develop relationships with adults while they're younger have a far greater chance of staying with their faith as they grow older. We experienced this in our own life. We had men uh, in this church uh, go to the second service who invested in our youngest son's life. Women in this room who've invested in our daughter's life. And it made a huge difference in them continuing on in their faith and having a vibrant faith today. Um, That's one. (laughs) Volunteer across ages. The other ones will go much faster. Uh, second, 
is this, participate in intergenerational missions and service trips. We do mission trips intergenerationally often because we see the value of having older and younger rubbing shoulders uh, as they serve others, especially in different cultures, whether it's Guatemala, whether it's Detroit. Each of our kids, when they were younger, were in intergenerational mission trips. Every single time they came home thinking and saying, at first it was kind of weird as a teenager hanging out with adults because you adults, not you mom and dad, but you adults are crazy. And sometimes the adults will say, why do we have to do stuff with the teens? But at the end of the day, you have three days, two days, five days you're spending together, you realize, man, I, I love this young man, this young woman, this older man, this older woman, and there's a, a connection that's made. That's why we do that in our church. We want you to interact together. It has so much value. Third, uh, seek out people from other generations. Here's what I challenge you to do, not right now, but when you get home, make a list of your friends. And, and put your friends into different age buckets. Maybe you've got the 20s and 30s or younger, you've got uh, 50s to 70s, whatever your age group. Make a, a list of your friends. And, and which of those groups, which of those buckets is missing people? That's the challenge that I'd like to give to you. And how can you find ways to change that by making new connections? Oftentimes in life, in our culture, even in the church, we segregate into different age groups. And it takes a conscious effort to do that mixing. We've got to do that. Um, and I'll give you a challenge if you're older. You define what that is. Older Christians in particular need to make an extra effort to connect with younger people. Uh, again, different studies, nearly one-third of Americans over age 65 say that they haven't made a new friend in the last five years. That's pretty sobering. Not one new friendship in the last five years. And lots of, this is our, our experience at this church, is that when we've encouraged people to cross-generationally pollinate, if I can say it that way, um, the younger generation is a bit intimidated by the older generation. Older generations need to take the first step. Most of the time, we need to be the ones, I include myself in that category, who are reaching out to the younger generation, inviting people to dinner. This is the, uh, the next one, start small. Um, so, so invite people to dinner. Invite an older couple out to lunch and just ask them about their faith journey. Ask them about life. Ask them advice about whatever things you're going on. And, and older generations, ask advice for younger generations. Ask, invite them out. They may not have any money. Take them out to a nice meal. Take a college student out to a meal. They, I, I don't know of any college student who will say no to a free meal. But make it nice. Don't just take them out for pizza. Take them out for a, a nice meal. You can afford it. Start small. Do this. Um, fifth, speak and listen charitably. I can't tell you how important this is. I started out on purpose telling some jokes about boomers and millennials. They're hurtful. And about millennials and boomers, they're equally hurtful about all the different generations. Each one of us can learn from one another, and we can't learn from one another. We can't have relationships that are actually really good with one another unless we set aside some of those prejudices about those Gen Xers, those Gen Zers, and their blah, blah, blah or these old people, they're blah, blah, blah. We can't connect together unless we can speak charitably, understand they're not going to have the same interests as us. They're not going to think the same way as us. Some of the things that they're thinking is, is, needs a lot of correction, and this could go either way. Some of the things that they're thinking actually needs to correct us. But speak charitably, speak with kindness, speak with grace, speak with love, ask questions, get to know each other. That's how we proceed in this life that God's called us to. We speak and act charitably and carefully and lovely and with grace. And then lastly this, and we'll close with this, find the connection. C.S. Lewis uh, once wrote, friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, what? You too? <laughs> I thought that nobody else but me. That's when friendship is born. 
And so as we search together and live life together and we have connection together, that's the attitude that we ought to take is, is to find other people, to learn from them, to love them well, to have grace, to listen, to care. That's the way that we as God's church can live in light of Christ, in light of the cross, have a healthy church, and to love one another well. That's what we mean when we say uh, cross-generational community. And so when you hear us use that phrase, it's not a, uh, a make-believe thing. It is us together living the gospel. Amen? And so, Father, we pray today and we're thankful that even in this room, we are a church that has babies and that has 90-some-year-olds and all in between, and that somehow you've drawn us together and that we can learn from one another. We're not meant to be here just living in separate metaphorical bedrooms, but we're meant to be here together as your people, caring for one another, living the gospel in our culture, in our generation, so that the world can see how Christ draws us together. So help us as we come alive in Jesus, we grow in Jesus, and we change the world in Jesus to do that across all ages for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you are five years old, God is faithful to you. If you're 15 years old, God is faithful to you. If you're 55 years old, 
God is faithful to you. If you're 90 years old, God is faithful to you. And everywhere in between, amen? Love for you to receive a blessing. If you want to lift your hands, lift your hearts, then your eyes. Go today in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ, the one who saves all generations. Amen and amen. Have a great day, everybody.